Hard drives, they're pretty handy to save your port, to save your games and archive your data. And ever since they've been commercialized for consumer use, they've just kept growing and growing in capacity. At the same time though, it's not like our needs have stayed the same. I mean, back in 2006, literally, you could get something like this, a 250 gig hard drive. And honestly, that was pretty big for the time. Fast forward to now, and there are games that barely fit in a drive like this. For example, Modern Warfare, I think, went all the way up to 235 gig for the game. So yeah, at some point, a future game might exceed that. Nowadays though, you can get something like this monster 16 terabyte drive in the same form factor. So how do they do it? I mean, it's the exact same size. Well, what's up guys, I'm Snows, and this is what we're talking about on your boot sequence. So this video is kind of a part one of two videos. This one will explain how the drive itself is made and some of the innovations that we're already seeing to get sizes like these. Whereas the second video will talk about future technologies for hard drives. So subscribe so you won't miss it. Now, let's talk about the fundamentals of a hard drive. And uh, look, ah, I, I, I had this one open already. Anyways, the platters. So the platters, well, they spin very fast and they also spin very close to other components. So it needs to be stiff and hard so it doesn't, you know, warble. Essentially, the platter puts the hard and hard disk drive or HDD. Now that platter can be made of metal, but that's as long as it's not magnetic. The most commonly used metal is actually aluminum. But did you know that you can also have them made out of glass and even ceramic? The material just needs to be stiff, hard, and non-magnetic. What absolutely needs to be magnetic though is the coating on that disc. So yeah, for the coating, the platters are coated with a thin film, and I mean thin. I mean, it's only about 10 to 20 nanometers thick. And that film is usually made of an iron and or cobalt alloy. That coating is basically plated on the disc itself. And if you were to zoom in on that plate, and I mean scanning electron microscope levels of zoom, well, you would see this. Microscopic, tiny little magnetized grains scattered all over. Think of it like sand on a beach except the grains of sands are tiny little metal shrapnel. These grains are all magnetized and their magnetic field is pretty much random at this point. Now, as you might already know, the digital world uses ones and zeros or bits, and those are written on the drive by magnetizing the grains in one direction or the other with the help of the right head. And with all of those grains, you could have insane amounts of bits, right? Yeah, but our technology isn't there yet since the magnetic magnetic field of a single grain is way too weak to detect. Instead, they group them up. So a handful of grains together makes a single bit. Those bits are arranged in concentric circles. Now the circles aren't there right off the bat. It's actually the right head that creates these circles. And there can be hundreds of thousands of those track rings that follow all the way down to the center of the disc, getting smaller and smaller. Now to read and write the data on the actual platter, well, you need the heads and where can you usually find heads on, on arms of course right the mechanical arms the arms are placed above and below the platter since data can be written on both sides they also swing up and down the radius of the platter while it spins to let the head read or write the data by magnetizing it now to some of you that might sound obvious but i found some fascinating facts about this while researching this episode the head not the arm but the head itself is orders of magnitude bigger than what is actually reading or writing your data look at this for example Everything that you see here is only there as a sort of aerofoil or wings. It helps the head hover or glide right above the disc as it spins. I mean, it's not like there's a lot of wind in a hard drive, but it still needs to glide over the disc without either hitting it or just flying away. Did you know that relative to the head, the outer edge of the disc can spin at 250 plus kilometers per hour? That's 160 plus miles per hour for you uh, Americans. That's insane. Anyways, the wings there are just for gliding. The thing that actually magnetizes the tracks is the right head and it's there. Can you see it? Yeah, me neither. 
I told you, it was small. You have to go into the nanometer scale to see it. You have a right pole like this on one end, which will write the data on the track. And you have a read head, which is a little bit smaller, which is these two little protrusions that read the bits with its north and south pole. It's insane how small this is. So yeah, those two things are the heart of the drive, the platter and the arm. Pretty simple. Now this drive is very old, it's from 2006, yet it's still in the same size, same form factor as this one here, which has 64 times the capacity. So how the hell do we go from this to this? Well, it took a lot of things to get here. So let's go through some of them. Originally, these drives used LMR, or Longitudinal Magnetic Recording. That means that the grains were magnetized along the disc with their poles going left and right. One breakthrough, which was pioneered quite a while ago, is PMR. With PMR, you take the bit, which is usually magnetized with the poles along the disc, and you just rotate the pole 90 degrees. This places the bits closer together and boom, extra capacity. They did have to innovate in the writing head technology though, going from what they call a ring to a monopole style right head. This LMR changed the game so much that it's just now called conventional magnetic recording. Another way to create larger capacity is quite simple. Just increase the number of platters. I mean, this one only has two. If we look at most high capacity drives these days, like an eight terabyte one, it would have more. Most eight terabyte drives actually have up to six platters. The problems start to arise here though. When you go above six platters and 12 read and write heads, things get hot. There's a lot of movement in these things and the laws of physics say, spinny, spinny, hot, hot. To fix that, manufacturers seal their drives with helium to reduce drag, which reduces the air friction for less heat. And thanks to the fact that aluminum is simply a better heat conductor, well, it increases thermal conductivity through the casing. That's pretty nice. So far, the maximum number of platters on helium sealed drives is nine platters and 18 drive heads, although they are looking into increasing that number. And that's while still using conventional read and write techniques. So far, they were able to stretch that capacity all the way up to 18 terabyte with this technology. It's insane. That's two terabytes per platter, a far cry from the 125 gigabytes per platter on this one. So what's next? We've had this record breaking 18 terabyte drive since late 2019 and we're in 2021. How do we make them hold more porn, hold more data? How about just more tracks on each platter? Well, this is where things start to break. The tracks are already pretty much at their thinnest for conventional methods. And the culprit here is specifically the right head of the drive. If we were to just make the tracks thinner and more close together, the risk of the head disturbing the next track over is very high. So how about making that right head smaller so it doesn't influence the adjacent rings? Well, the problem here becomes the strength of the magnet. It won't be able to magnetize the bits on that track with enough reliability. There's also accuracy to consider. Obviously, magnets and magnetic fields aren't digital. It's not perfect ones and zeros. So you could have grains that are mostly magnetized in this direction, while another might be mostly magnetized in that direction. You see, what the chips on the back of a hard drive do is make this decision for you. Is it a zero or is it a one? Is the magnetic field pointing this way or that way. So if the strength of the magnet is too weak or too strong, it might be hard for that chip to decide and data becomes corrupted. So how about making the head closer to the platter so that the uh, magnetic field works better? Well, it's already flying at only about five nanometers from the platter, so I think they kind of maxed that out too. Well, there is one other way of adding storage, a saving grace of sorts, but not everyone likes it. It helps us reach up to 20 terabytes in capacity. So that's pretty impressive. It's called SMR. The thing is the read head can still be made to read thinner tracks than the right head can write. So how do we leverage that? Well, it's called SMR and it works like this. You write data on a track and boom, all is well. Then if you want to write on the next track over, you can, but just keep in mind, I guess, that you're gonna be removing a small portion of the other track. It's still readable, but you're still writing over it. 
As long as you leave a portion at the top of the previous track intact, then you can still read it. Remember, the reading part of the head is way smaller than the right head. So you can keep going like this and we can shingle it like that, which is why it's called shingled magnetic recording, just like the shingles on a roof. But what happens if you delete a track that has been overlapped on? For example, I wanna write new information here, but the right head is so big, it would delete part of the second track. So that's a no-no, what do I do? Well, this is where the big drawback is. What the drive needs to do is read the information that might be affected because of the shingling, store it in its flash memory, delete the information on both tracks, and then write in the new information on track one before writing and restoring what was on track two. See how overcomplicated that could be? So this brings slowdowns as the drive fills up since it will constantly need to do this and it adds just unnecessary latency. It can also create issues in RAID arrays. SMR isn't exclusive to 20 terabyte drive though, so watch out. You can find them in as low as 500 gigabyte hard drives. So if you plan on filling a drive up and continuously exchanging data, you might wanna make sure that you're looking for a CMR drive or conventional magnetic recording drive. I mean, it's not always clear and it's often not written on the actual product, so you better look at the specs sheet of the drive itself uh, if you're planning on avoiding SMR drives specifically. All right, so we could add up to nine platters thanks to the helium, or we can shingle the data, which isn't ideal. So is there other ways of adding capacity or are we going to have four and a half inch drives now? You know, you just can have like 12 platters or something. Well, there is more, and they're called AMRs, or Assisted Magnetic Recording Technologies. These though, I'll keep for the second video since they're about the future of hard drives. Well, this concludes it for today's video. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Leave a like if you liked it, a comment if you have anything specific to add, or if you just wanna say hi. As usual, you can click right here to see the latest video, right here to subscribe to the channel. Stay frosty, my dudes, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Rolling them dice, I love it, I love it, I'm fine Canvas to faces, I'm painting these pictures of mine Rolling them dice, I love it